By definition, it is disc edema with raised intracranial tension. Okay, look at this picture. You see the diffuse edematous disc over here. This is what we term as papilledema, and definition is it is disc edema with raised intracranial tension, not intraocular, it's intracranial tension. Now, normally the intracranial tension is about 50 to 180 millimeters of water. But then the pressures which cause papilledema in adults when it is above 250 millimeters of water and in children when it is above 200 millimeters of water. So 250 millimeters for adults and 200 millimeters for children this causes papilledema. So the pathology behind this is there is a stasis of the axoplasmic flow in the optic nerve. There are two types of axoplasmic flows we know that is orthograde and retrograde. So when there is a stasis in this orthograde type of axoplasmic flow this results in Papilledema. Now what causes this stasis? The first and most common is intracranial space occupying lesions mostly in the posterior fossa except the tumors in medulla. Okay, Those occupying the posterior fossa they are the most common tumors causing papilledema. Now an important fact over here that the more posterior the tumor more is the papilledema. As you keep going posteriorly, uh, the tumor, the papilledema is more. Okay. The second most common cause is pseudo uh, tumor cerebri. Okay. It's a pseudo tumor cerebri and it is also known as idiopathic intracranial hypertension. Okay. It's idiopathic intracranial hypertension and it is a diagnosis of exclusion. Okay. So, whom would you suspect this in? You will suspect this in young fat females with unexplained headaches. Now, young females with headaches, you have ruled out all the other causes. Then you will conclude that she's having IIH. Okay. Along with headache, the patient also complains of pulsatile tinnitus. This is a prominent feature of idiopathic intracranial hypertension. Pulsatile tinnitus. Now, the third cause of papilledema is meningitis, that is, any infections. And the fourth one is subarachnoid or intracerebral hemorrhage. Now, a differentiating feature for this point is that there is a sudden papilledema because hemorrhage is always sudden, and when there is sudden hemorrhage and sudden rise in intracranial pressure, that will result in a acute onset papilledema. So the four causes of papilledema are intracranial space occupying lesions, intracranial hypertension idiopathic, then meningitis and hemorrhage that could be subarachnoid or intracranial, intracerebral. Now let's look at the clinical features. Now the first important feature is as we have discussed headache. It is of occipital headache and is of throbbing or pulsating type and it changes with changing posture, worsens with Valsalva maneuver. Okay. Occipital type of headache that is of throbbing nature or pulsating nature, then it changes with uh, the uh, changing posture of the patient and worsens with straining, coughing, sneezing or any Valsalva procedure. That is the characteristic headache of uh, papilledema. Then the second feature is Projectile vomiting. Now we know that by the term projectile we mean that there is no prior nausea. Okay. The next feature is amaurosis fugax. The very uh, translation of this into English is sudden transient temporary loss of vision. Okay. Or simply transient obscuration of vision is nothing but amaurosis fugax. So, so suddenly the patient cannot see anything. Everything goes dark. And immediately as sudden as it started, he will regain his vision. This is amaurosis fugax. And obviously on examination, it is your disc edema is present. Followed by sixth nerve palsy. It is a false localizing sign in papilledema. Okay, the sixth nerve palsy as well. So the clinical features of papilledema, let's revise. It's headache. 
as of occipital throbbing type increases with valsalva maneuver and a posture then projectile vomiting amaurosis fugax disc edema and sixth nerve palsy now we have earlier seen in our earlier neuroophthalmology session a condition called optic neuritis it resembled papal edema very much so how will you differentiate papal edema from optic neuritis is that papal edema by rule is always bilateral okay except for a condition called foster kennedy syndrome where it is unilateral okay in foster kennedy syndrome papal edema is unilateral and in all other conditions it's always bilateral we'll see what this foster kennedy syndrome is okay before that now compared to the disc edema in optic neuritis papal edema has very high disc edema okay the level of disc edema is too much and the third one striking feature is your patent's lines these are circumferential lines around the optic disc see you can see these lines over here okay these are your patent's lines and are characteristic for papal edema these are absent in optic neuritis then there's loss of venous pulsations along with enlargement of the blind spot in visual fields this is how you will differentiate papal edema from optic neuritis okay now let's see foster kennedy syndrome just a few words about it it is seen in frontal lobe tumors as i have told already there's ipsilateral optic atrophy that is only unilateral optic atrophy and contralateral disc edema okay that is again unilateral disc edema unilateral optic atrophy with contralateral disc edema see this is your um, typical foster kennedy syndrome occurs in frontal lobe tumors is the only condition where papal edema is unilateral okay Hello everyone, this is Dr. Sai Suguna, your mentor for ophthalmology at Medico App. Now, thanks for watching the video. Now we have put such videos all together in our ophthalmology app. The trial version you can download from the link over here or in the description box below.